Thank you all for taking the time to join Atrium's market update for today. I am Marcy Kochachua, head of Atrium Wealth. In today's webinar, Atrium's chief investment officer, Mr. Philip Hagedorn, will be sharing his insights on how the pandemic has affected the Philippine economy and what the investment team at Atrium is doing to seek out long-term opportunities. This is a very timely topic given that the first quarter GDP and inflation numbers were just released. He will be joined by our head of macro and ESG research. So make sure to keep your eyes on the webinar as you will also be participating actively today. Right after, of course, you will have a 10 minute opportunity to ask your questions and we will be giving the answers as well. And we will wrap up with a quick feedback survey. So don't miss it out. Viewers, you can submit questions throughout the discussion by clicking on the Q&A button found below your screens. You can choose to ask a question anonymously in the options. Before we begin, please take note that this webinar is being recorded and that copies will be sent within the day and posted on our social media pages. Let's get started. Here's Atrium's Chief Investment Officer, Mr. Philip Hagedorn. Thank you, Marcy, and uh, good morning to everybody. Thank you for joining us again today. Very happy to have everyone here with us. Uh, first of all, we're hoping and praying that you're all in good health and safe as, uh, as we continue to deal with the present, um, but think about the future as well and um, are hopeful and optimistic as well. So let me get going. What we want to do today really is walk you through uh, GDP uh, and what our forecasts of GDP uh, will be for this year. Um, and, you know, I know that economics and GDP discussions are not always the most fun to have, um, but we're going to try and get you all involved uh, in answering some survey questions along the way, uh, which will help see whether our forecasts are uh, on the optimistic or pessimistic end of what the room today thinks. No? Um, and, um, and I think it'll help you also understand a little bit more what goes into uh, Philippine growth. GDP, quick way to understand or remember what it is. This was taught to me by a head of research in the past. Dawa dito sa Pilipinas. Everything done here and spent here. Uh, and that's uh, what we want is for that to grow every year. And that means the country is growing. So let's get started and um, with some breaking news. Uh, less than an hour ago, the government announced first quarter GDP results. And the number was negative for the first time uh, since the global financial crisis. Well, I don't even think we got the negative then. <laughs> it's been a long, long time since we posted a negative number. And in the first quarter of 2020, GDP contracted by just under one, just under zero, so 0.2%. Many folks estimated, including ourselves, that growth would be close to 3% for the first quarter. Of course, in the beginning of the year, that number was significantly higher, but um, clearly effects of one, the Taal uh, disruptions that caused, second, the, um, the obvious breakout of, of COVID in early March uh, have had significant impact to GDP in the first quarter. So moving on from here, what are some of the key messages that we want to share with you on slide, the next slide? Um, first, first is that Philippine GDP, and maybe this is something to remember, is really dependent on household consumption. We are not a manufacturing country. We're not an ex a large exporting country. Uh, we're a country fueled by consumption and, um, and obviously, Part of that comes from OFW remittances 
and but a larger part comes from the job creation and um, and involvement uh, locally. No? So that's much more important <laughs> than OFW remittances uh, as far as consumption is concerned. Um, what we'll try to do today is try to understand some of the discretionary spending patterns we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go through in the next few months um, to to try and gauge uh, what's gonna drive our growth. No? Uh, and finally, we'll see how this compares to our forecasts um, and see if the room is more uh, optimistic or more pessimistic than Atram is as far as our forecast is concerned. So the next slide is we cannot talk about GDP without talking a little bit about COVID. And uh, all of our forecasts for GDP are, ex are with the expectation that uh, by the middle of May, uh, next week, we're gonna see uh, more mobility and a beginning of moving back to business as usual. But I wanna stress that we don't expect this to happen in a very quick fashion. Uh, it will be a slow buildup um, and the government, uh, for this to happen, for us to really begin to open up next week, two things we need to see and look at very carefully. One is that the number of tests that we do every day continue to increase. The chart on the left shows you that uh, by the blue line, the blue horizontal line, uh, those are the number of tests per day and we're seeing that uh, more recently, starting in early May, we're starting to do over 6,000 tests a day. So that would be very good. Uh, our understanding is there are significant number of new testing centers opening up uh, over the next few days, actually. And we're hopeful that we can see tests closer to eight to 10,000 per day by the time we hit the middle of May. As a result of these tests, we expect to see higher infection numbers. Um, the more important number that we're looking at is the average. Um, and as long as the average can continue to go down, in other words, number of positives versus number of tests given on a daily basis, then this kind of shows that we may have the virus under control and that the government can begin opening up. The other key bit of data that the government is also looking at is the number of beds that are available as we do more testing and expect more positives. And uh, um, you know, we're seeing that we still have quite a bit of capacity uh, for this um, uh, to happen over the next few days. So. Um, we're quite comfortable where we are. We're quite comfortable that we can maintain our forecast that uh, um, that beginning of the middle of May, uh, right around the middle of May, that we'll expect uh, business activity to start to uh, improve in a more uh, aggressive, um, but still paced fashion. No? Um, so moving on to the forecast, the next slide gives you a bit of a feel of how GDP or what determines GDP. And what determines it is uh, how we and the rest of the world spends. And simply put, to try and simplify this, household con consumption de uh, determines about 58% of the growth of GDP. Government spending, around 10%. Um, uh, capital formation, which is investments of corporations, around 25%. And net exports are how the world, how we invest in the world and the world uh, invests in the Philippines. In other words, we're, uh, we're a net importer in this case, it's minus 8%. Um, so these are the four key pillars of what determines GDP growth. Um, and what we're gonna do is go into each and every one of them uh, one by one. So 
So um, next slide. Um, let's look at capital formation initially. Uh, capital formation is uh, really investments of corporations, um, primarily in construction, durable goods, bio stocks. Um, and our expectation is investments will contract um, uh, close to 10%. Basically, from our reviews of many companies, we've had a chance to speak with many corporations over the last few weeks. Um, the main, one of the key messages we're getting from many of them is that uh, CAPEX spending will slow down. Uh, so whatever CAPEX budgets people have for this year uh, expected to, to be reduced significantly. One key example I'll, I'll share with you is Ayala Land. I think this is, I've been shared uh, in their own webinars. Uh, they had a budget of about 100 billion pesos in CAPEX for this year. Uh, that's likely to drop uh, uh, to around 70 billion, but it doesn't mean they're not spending. They're just not going to be spending as much as they uh, originally had planned. Um, companies are looking to preserve cash uh, for liquidity really being the top priority. Um, so we can expect investments to slow, but not to come to a complete halt. And we are expecting... Uh, for the year 2020, an average of about 8.7, and 8 .7, close to 9% uh, drop in, in capital formation because of this. The next slide is government spending. And for me, this is a very important one um, because the government has money. The budget is there. It's been passed. There's a 14, almost 15% increase. So there's more fiscal stimulus uh, to, to be able to help us get out of this uh, um, uh, situation that we're in. Um, unfortunately, much of this is uh, um, also on the construction side. So um, we need to uh, get the lockdowns lifted and start the construction cycle again so jobs can get created and the government can, can really spend their whole budget for this year. That's what we're expecting that they do. Um, and we do expect that in the next week, we'll also see Congress uh, make some changes to their own, uh, uh, to allow for the government to be a bit flexible with the budget uh, and make sure that they spend as soon as they can. Um, the next slide is ex exports and imports, um, which make up about 10%. Uh, Again, um, we will be a net importer. We expect that completely. But because of the slowdown in construction, which has been a big driver of imports, that we will expect some sort of a decline there as well, close to 10%. Um, uh, oil prices have dropped. Uh, same with semiconductor prices. So uh, that's also putting some pressure on, on the absolute value. Um, and we'll certainly expect lower trade volumes uh, given the lockdowns across the world. So um, as you can see on, on all three front fronts, uh, capital formation, government spending, and exports, uh, we're expecting contraction across the three. So now we're going to talk really about the consumption side. And this is where we hope to get some, some of your inputs as well. No? Starting with slide nine, consumption is made up of these many areas. No? Um, food and non-alcoholic beverages, tobacco, clothing, uh, alcoholic beverages, et cetera. No? Education, miscellaneous, transportation. Um, this is basically what we spend as Filipinos in the Philippines. Um, and what we'll try and do is dissect or uh, try to understand uh, what we've tried to do as a firm and try to, uh, to help us forecast GDP is how each and every single one of these areas will be affected. So if you normally spend one peso for clothing and footwear, footwear a year, that's just a relative number, are you gonna spend 50 centavos of that, 75 centavos of that, one peso 50 of that moving forward no? in the next 
two quarters, two to three quarters. <clears throat> so that's how we plan to, uh, to work the survey that we're going to run in a second. Give me a drink here. <laughs> ah, thank you. So um, the next slide just gives you a bit of a, a show of the breakdown. When you look at consumption, uh, food and beverage makes up about 42% of that number. Um, and non-food makes up about 58% of that number. You know? um, so we have forecasts and we're going to be focusing again the survey on sort of the non-food non consumption uh, area. Um, I think on food and beverage, um, you know, it's long ass and I continue to pray that everybody has their three meals a day. We're not likely to consume more, but we're also not likely to consume significantly less than what we consume. What will change will be the discretionary non-food consumption breakdown. And that's where we want your help today. So, um, well, why don't we go back to that slide? Just wanna show that everybody, uh, how this breaks down. So the other factors and miscellaneous make up a huge part of this. Um, and we're, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that is in the survey. Um, uh, transport, which is uh, kind of the use of your car. Will, be, will you use your car uh, to go on road trips or continue to drive to the office five times a week or six times a week, depending on your job? Will you use recreation and go to restaurants in the same way? These are the type of questions that we asked ourselves and tried to estimate uh, whether we will have a increase, a decrease, or spend the same in these sectors. Um, so let's go to the survey and help, uh, let's see if you can uh, help us uh, understand the numbers that we're, we're looking at and, and how they match with your expectations. So the first question here um, that we're looking at is over the next six months, for travels to the office and out of town, do you expect to use your car or do you expect your car versus usage last year to be more often, same use or less often? And we don't have a lot of time. I mean, we don't want to keep you on this webinar too long. So let's answer the questions as quickly as possible. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll have the results uh, come out and talk a little bit about them. So here are the quick results. Clearly, everybody believes we're going to use uh, our cars less often. Jamar, uh, can you give a comment quickly against what we thought here? Yep. Um, the survey results are also reflect our the same or similar to our expectations of reduction in transportation expenditure. Okay, thank you, Joar. Um, we're gonna go to the next question and at the end we'll reveal the, the absolute numbers. Now, so um, second question we have here is for second half of 2020, uh, do you plan or desire to upgrade, downgrade, or do nothing to your data plan at home or at the office? Uh, those are quick results. Most do nothing uh, with 31% upgrading. Damar, how does that compare with us? I feel so for us, we're actually expecting um, slight growth in communications expense. Uh, so if I just look at this, it, it kind of matches to a certain extent, but there's some bearishness as well with respect to communications expenditure with, as far okay. as the survey is concerned. So it's a slightly Thank you. more bearish. Thank you, slightly more bearish. I think our expectation is um, because of all of this, especially what we're doing today, for example, with Zoom and all of this, that uh, people are going to be signing up and using a lot more data than they normally have in the past. No? Next question, please. Uh, for the second half of 2020, and of course, if you have children in school, 
you expect tuition fees to be reduced, stay the same, or increase? And I guess there is a follow-up question here. So most of us are saying, say the same, with a very mixed result as far as being reduced or increased. Uh, there's a follow-up for education, since it's an important part. Um, uh, if you have children, would you consider homeschooling or distance learning? Strictly, in other words, that's the only option that you'll go for. Um, actually, yeah, that's a big number. That means, I think in general, Jomar, the result means that people are expecting to spend a little less, trying to spend less on education. Is that the way I'm reading it here? Correct, correct. Um, if we are going to go for homeschooling, that would be a reduction in educational expenditures. But as far as tuition is concerned, it seems that they, uh, the survey reflects that uh, our participants believe that the tuition fees will will uh, remain the same. For our own, we expect some reduction uh, in, term, in terms of uh, education. And part of that is actually timing in a sense because the, um, because the school year has moved already uh, a bit forward. Uh, so there is some displacement, but with respect to, to, to tuition, we do expect some either flat or no growth. Oh, sorry, Thank uh, you. flat or uh, some, some decline. Okay, next question. For the second half of 2020, do you plan to or desire to buy a new smartphone or tablet for yourself, <clears throat> family, or any other person? Nobody wants to spend, okay? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Liquidity, remember, let's keep our money. Yeah. Uh, if we don't need to spend, uh, that's what you should do. <laughs> um, next question. And this might be an obvious one. Relative to last year, do you expect to eat out in restaurants, go to salons, barber shops, spas? Um, same number of time, less often, more often. I think overwhelmingly, uh, <laughs> nobody wants to spend any money. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone's so, still in the ECQ uh, mindset, huh, Phil? <laughs> yeah, I mean, although somebody told me this week that humans will do what humans want to do. So when, uh, <laughs> when things feel a little better, we're going to probably uh, be more aggressive in doing what we want to do. Yeah. You should, um, you should ask this, uh, you should do this survey again, exactly the same things a month from now. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's go to the next slide and we'll show you a little bit of what our thoughts were on all of these areas. Um, and so this, this, were, this was our view. Um, you know, interestingly enough, we're really expecting a lot more of the health expense to go up significantly. Not sure if that's via insurance or just your healthcare needs, but uh, that's good. And well, that's good one. And I think the government should be allocating more resources to spending on health as well. Food will still grow. And I think that's maybe driven a little bit by population. Our view is that people will continue to have the basic three meals a day requirement. And uh, for now that seems to be the case. So we're not too concerned. Where we see big drops and in line with what we're thinking in the survey, clothing and footwear, furnishing households, transport, recreation, education, uh, and restaurants and hotels are gonna see a big drop. So I think that's the obvious. Ultimately, um, the last slide that we have for today is our forecast. And this is what, what we think is gonna happen. This year, we expect GDP to contract for the full year at 3.2%. I do wanna have a caveat though, because we did tell ourselves that we would wait for the first quarter number to review this outlook. And since it's come out today, and our forecast for the first quarter was still quite high. We thought we'd still be somewhere around three and a half percent that I would think we have down, uh, downward um, uh, scenario here for the 3.2% current forecast. So 
it may turn out to be weaker than what we think. Um, but the way we think we will recover is similar. So this U-shaped recovery that we're looking at on the chart on the right is our, still our expectations of a recovery. The question is how steep does a negative get and how quickly can we recover? Uh, because we do expect the recovery uh, to be in place by the fourth quarter of this year where spending will start to move back to more normal uh, levels. Uh, and because of the low base effect of these quarters, we potentially will see very high or elevated GDP numbers next year, then normalizing in 2022. You know? um, so the forecast for us, minus 3.2, with a potential for further downgrades, likely, uh, for the peso, uh, this one, we're maintaining our current uh, outlook of 51 and a half to 52, but we also feel that there's downward, the peso is likely to stay as stronger than weaker this year. And so um, uh, uh, we are reviewing these, these forecasts as well, and we'll make any changes together with our, after the review of the first quarter numbers. Uh, we're not expecting much inflation. Um, uh, primarily because our import demand is, is low and, and what we import is, is cheap right now. Uh, food inflation, thank God right now is not a problem. Uh, and we need to keep an eye on that because there are challenges from our suppliers as well that have developed primarily for rice. So we need to watch this uh, over the next few months. Um, and finally, the current account deficit, we see very well under control as a matter of fact, probably not as steep as what we have forecasted as we adjust <coughs> for lower spending in this, uh, uh, in this second half of 2020. So uh, these are our numbers. Um, and again, uh, happy to take now questions that are out there from the group. And if we do run out of time, we'll endeavor to answer those questions uh, uh, online and, and via email or via our social media pages. So uh, thank you again for having us today. And uh, I hope today was a little bit more interesting than your normal webinar. And thank you for uh, participating. It was uh, great to see a lot of people uh, participating in the, in the surveys. Thank you. Yeah, Jill, actually I already got uh, an early feedback for you. They love the survey. So uh, you should be thinking of doing more of these interactive things. So let's now move on to uh, the questions. Uh, there was a question that came in. If cash is king, should investments in financial products, such as investment funds, be limited as well? What's your opinion on that? Well, the reason cash is king is you want to have it to make investments. You know, um, so I think obviously when, when there's a panic situation and um, you know, you're in the middle of the storm, you, you don't act very aggressively and try to maintain your cash. Uh, but uh, uh, even as the storm, the storm doesn't just disappear, it lightens up. And we feel it lightening up, and this is a time where you need to put that cash to work. Um, and I'm not suggesting, you know, going out and buying equities or being very aggressive, but Fixed income is giving you some decent opportunity for return. Um, corporate bonds are giving you some decent opportunity for return uh, because cash, if it sits as cash, is gonna earn very, very little. I agree, it won't lose much and with inflation low, it's not a bad strategy for the short term, but, um, but as the sky is clear, you want to start investing that cash. Um, and we feel the skies are clearing. Yeah, so cash is actually really to just get ready for bargain hunting. <laughs> so another well, You can't bargain hunt if you don't have any cash. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, another question, I think this was sent a lot earlier during registration. Um, the BSP governor said he will pause policy easing. Uh, does this mean bond yield will go, won't go lower anymore despite the 10-year Philippine bond and 10-year U.S. bond still which still have a 20, 250 plus bid spread. Is that the correct? Uh, we, we, think, we think rates are gonna go lower. Okay. Um, there's one thing about the central bank and the benchmarks and what they do. 
and we think they have paused for now, but you know, we still have six, seven months to go before the end of the year. So we're certainly expecting uh, more stimulus to be provided um, and rates to be kept low and rates to even move lower. I, we think the big move is done, but that doesn't mean there's not more room for rates to come down. All right, another question. Um, what should be the time frame to look at in terms of returns? I guess a uh, uh, related question to this is what is our forecast to the PSEI? Well, we have a fundamental forecast of about 7150 today for the PSEI. Um, and, you know, the way I approach investments and returns is obviously you want to think of the long term, right? Where will you be a year from, at least a year from now? Uh, I do agree, though, that in these types of situations, and honestly, when I ask all of our participants, you got to embrace this time. You know, hopefully we don't go through this too often in our lifetimes, but embrace it, protect obviously what you can protect, your cash, but there will be opportunities. Uh, you don't get these opportunities too often. Um, and you also don't need to go all in. I mean, this is a time where you can pace your investments, uh, you know, pick and choose your spots. There's no immediate rush. But that mindset has to be there, that, that investment mindset, you need to have it. You need to be thinking, who are the guys that are gonna emerge out of this stronger? Um, because you can buy uh, their bonds or their, um, their stocks at prices or valuations that uh, probably were not available, you know, were certainly not available even three months ago. Um, and the businesses have slowed down, but you know, things will come back. Things will come back. And we feel that um, it's not gonna take too long. We think that by next year, we should be going back to more normal spending and growth patterns. We think that by next year, people will be people and do what people like to do. <laughs> uh, if you wanna travel, you'll probably go back to traveling. Uh, maybe it'll be different. Maybe it'll be more expensive. Uh, maybe your the airlines won't pack them in the way they used to. There'll be more space, but um, but people will travel. So uh, people will eat in restaurants again. Um, uh, it's just trying to, as an investor, trying to determine when that will happen. That's the that's the tricky part. Yeah. And when it will happen is when when we get the virus under control, when there's a, when there's a vaccine, these are the obvious, you know, everybody's had these comments in any newscast about uh, the normal times, but, and I don't want to, using the word new normal is overused. We, we heard that 10 years ago with the global crisis, we're hearing it now. This is just evolution. People change, things happen, and people change and move on. Uh, and normally it's to a better place, right? We don't normally pedal back. So um, that's the way we're looking at it. Um, but but like I said, in a in a more deliberate, more um, there's no rush uh, to do anything, um, but having a plan and slowly executing that plan. Okay, uh, I think I'll throw. Um a couple more questions, the rest of it. There's a lot actually coming in, uh, Phil. So I think we'll have to uh, respond to those uh, later on. Uh, but uh, while we're still in the webinar, this a couple more questions. How do you see the development of digital banking uh, in the next few months? It's, uh, are, do you think we're ready for a cashless society, Phil? Um, you know, we're going there. It's and. Honestly, I think what's happened in these last three or four months is just turbo boosting that process yep. by a lot faster than what uh, many people thought. I mean, uh, one super advocate of this has been Mr. Gusto Ortiz, yeah. uh, uh, chairman of uh, Emeritus of Union Bank. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he was talking, I had a chat with him recently and and hopefully we'll have him on one of these days. 
to share his thoughts. But his big frustration was user experience. You know, yes, ang galing ng ano, BDO online or BPI or Union Bank online, pero I'll just send my messenger to do the work in the branch and I'll send my secretary <laughs> to do that. And that's what people did. And you can't yeah. do that now. And now they're having to, to do it digitally and say, wow, this is actually really convenient and good. And, and so if we've been able to turbocharge that user experience, then there's a bright future for that. And it's going to make things a lot more efficient, um, much more convenient. Uh, and for those of us that already use it, you know, um, you're preaching to the converted because many of us have been doing this for a while, just it hasn't caught on and it's now catching on in a Very big good. way. So, big way. yeah, as they say, you know, uh, the CTO's uh, work was actually taken care of by COVID. So a bit ironic there. Uh, so a last question for you, Phil. Uh, what percentage of investable funds should our clients or, you know, people who want to start going back into the markets, should they allocate for the opportunities that the situation is presenting? Let me get that right. What what percentage of investable funds? Yes. So I guess if they're now in cash, uh, what portion of it do you believe would be a you know a smart way? Well, right now we still think that the you know a significant part of that, probably three fourths, easily, should be in fi Philippine fixed income already, uh, via total return bond fund uh, strategy. It's a very uh, it's a, it's one of, it's our best performing fund I think year to date uh, with almost five percent or four percent returns um, and there's upside still for that uh, we think it's a safe way to get start to get invested and get a better return than your cash would be getting um, we think there is room to start building an equity position already so um, you know buying equities whether you want to go index via the index fund or you want some active risk. So our core equity strategy, equity opportunity fund today has about 75% of, of the fund invested in 12 large cap companies that we think will be the winners in the future. That's a big part of that fund invested in those 12 companies. Um, uh, and I think that reflects some active decision making on our end uh, that these will be the, the winners in the future. So those are the two strategies that I would probably start with uh, when looking at equities. No? Thank you very much, Phil. I, I think that's it for us uh, today. We've, uh, we've gone over our usual 30 minutes. I guess it's been uh, quite an interesting session. Um, thank you very much, uh, as always for your very comprehensive coverage, Phil, and uh, in making it quite interesting today uh, with the interactive session. Right, uh, we'll, we'll try to do that more often and make investments fun. That way you can all participate more uh, in, the, in, the, in the webinars and in investing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, so folks, uh, we will be wrapping up the webinar right now. But uh, there is a survey that we are sending to all of you. And I hope you spend uh, you know, a couple of minutes just to give us feedback on how uh, you had found this webinar because that will actually help on how we do these weekly sessions with you. Thank you very much and uh, a very good day for all of you who had joined us uh, this Thursday. <laughs>